Hello, uh, my name is Jen. Thanks so much for having me today, for entertaining um, my brain. That is what I run as a business owner. Um, I uh, am not gonna lie, I'm kind of realizing I might have a little bit of ADHD. So I like kept some notes, that way I could stay on track. Otherwise we'll end up somewhere wild, I don't know. Um, so I'll kind of uh, get started with, with where my notes are going. Um, when I was prepping for today, I actually decided to Google, like what, what does entrepreneurship even mean? Because Paige messaged me and was like, hey, um, we're doing this thing. We'd really like to have you participate. And I was like, me? Like, why? I, I don't know anything about business. And um, in fact, I think I even emailed them a little bit later. And I was just like, hey, are you sure? Without a doubt, like I have anything valuable to add for these people. And um, they were like, no, I definitely, I think you will. So to entertain myself, I Googled what entrepreneur and entrepreneurship means. And this is what I found. Entrepreneurship is the activity of setting up a business or businesses and taking on the financial risk and hope for gaining profit. So like I said, I'd be lying to you guys if I had considered myself an entrepreneur before Paige had reached out to me. But now that I've kind of looked at that definition, I guess when you put it that way, I kind of am. So where that comes from for me is where I grew up in the time period that I grew up with how I grew up. I was told often that somebody who looks like me, who dresses like me, who talks like me, um, somebody who loves people the way that I love people, that I wouldn't be able to find success in this world. So like if you grew up in the 90s, y'all know that was a wild time. You're welcome for the fashion, but thank God we're moving past all of the crazy like toxicity that was boys do this, girls do that. You must do this and you must do that. Um, it was wild. Anyway, I was born August 27th, 1988. Yes, I am a Virgo. Sorry, I'm not sorry. I mean, that's pretty typical Virgo response. I came into a pretty old school, traditional Mexican-American family. Uh, we moved around a lot. My dad was in the military. I knew that I was a queer person by the time I was like six. Um, and it was also kind of around that time that I started to hate myself as well. My family was really, really religious. Um, so to say that I was the black sheep is probably the simplest way to like sum up uh, what early life was like for me. What I did know at that time, though, was that I wanted to do something. I felt like I was destined to do something big. I remember being a kid and like, I wanted to do everything, right? Like I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to be all of these things. Um, and I didn't know what, but I just knew I was supposed to do something or I wanted to do something or whatever. I guess the thing that I didn't know at that time was that the thing that I was meant to do is actually like this. It's what I'm doing now. So I opened an LGBTQ plus hair studio in downtown Olympia, October of 2021. Now, obviously I am a queer person and I do run, own and operate a queer barbershop. It's not exclusive in the sense that if you are not a queer person, you're not allowed, but my industry is so gendered and uh, we're, we're still there, like we're, we're moving, but there's still so much gender that happens in hair, right? Men's hair, women's hair, long hair, short hair, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I opened up my shop specifically for me. I didn't have anywhere to go and I wanted somewhere, my friends to be able to come where I wouldn't be embarrassed. I didn't want people to have to deal with the toxic masculinity that happens in barber shops, And I didn't want people to have to deal with the like hyper femininity that happens in salons. And early in my career, when I was expressing to other people in my industry that like I wanted to open a queer space, it was so easy like to dismiss that. People were just like, no, there's no need for that. Like people can just go to a salon or go to a barbershop. 
And if you're not a queer person or even just a unique individual that likes to look however you like to look, like you don't understand maybe what it feels like to have people box you in and say, you have to look this way. So I opened up my shop two years ago. I'm actually four days away from my second anniversary. And I'm super duper proud. Thank you, thank you. I'm so proud of the fact that I actually just hired an apprentice. Um, I've also brought on a second barber. Uh, we just were talking yesterday about adding more, adding them onto the schedule. I have added a second chair into my studio. Um, and I'm also adding and expanding to add hair color services onto the menu. So it's crazy how fast everything has happened. I'm starting to get a lot more people that are like, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing. I'd really like to work with you. So it's still kind of um, mind boggling to me that I'm experiencing everything that I'm experienced because when I talk to you about imposter syndrome or when we just mention imposter syndrome in general, like I need you to really hear and believe that I woke up however long it's been since Paige contacted me and I had no idea that I was an entrepreneur until I'm like sitting here sharing with you guys a little bit of knowledge that I've gained over the last 10 years. Now, academia, school, it's always been like really, really difficult for me. So props to you guys. I commend you for pursuing that. I don't have the brain for that. I'm pretty sure that I have some undiagnosed learning disabilities. So math, never maths for me, like ever. Um, so thankfully, like the universe gifted me with a partner who's a human calculator and we kind of have this running joke that I'm I'm certain about one thing for sure in math and that is that half of 16 is eight like that is the extent of where my brain wants to cap out and that's crazy and also slightly dangerous because like I'm a business person I should know numbers and you know I've put a little bit of processes in place so that I can track these things pretty easily but just as a baseline understanding, I'm not somebody that has a bunch of knowledge. I don't come from a business family. I am the first person to do that in my entire family, probably. Um, my grandfather did work quite hard and, and he got to incredible places um, but as far as like becoming an entrepreneur and doing it myself in my own way, like I'm the first person, I don't have school education. Um, I told my parents when I was really young, I wanted to be a hairdresser and like an unfortunate thing of the nineties again was being a hairdresser had a bit of a reputation, right? Like when girls got pregnant, they had to drop out and like go get a GED. Right. And so it was like beauty school dropout. If you've ever seen Greece. Um, that was something that, that was the reputation, right? So when I'm telling my parents like, Hey, this is what I want to do. They, that's what their mind is hearing. And I love them for it. I know their intentionality was so pure, but they were just like, you're too smart. Like maybe try something else. And so I did. Um, I actually, looked for an academic loophole, as I like to call it, because my brain, academics, I genuinely, I really did not want to go to college. Um, so I applied for a graphic design program um, at the Art Institute of Dallas, where I was living at the time. And once I got there, I realized there is a huge difference in like enjoying to draw and like being any good at it. <laughs> So if anybody has ever taken like a life drawing class or even just tried to like YouTube how to draw, like, oh my gosh, trying to draw stuff will humble you so fast. Um, I, I was not any good and it's going to sound really crazy because that didn't work out. And when I tell you why it didn't, it might sound a little bit, I was in a grease fire. <clears throat> I was in a grease fire when I was 19 years old and I had second, third, and fourth degree burns on both of my hands. You can't really tell too much nowadays. It healed up really nice. I've got a little bit of a scar and you can see some two tonality here on my hands, but 
I was laid up in the hospital for about two weeks, second, third, fourth degree burns on my hands. Um, they actually sent me home from the emergency room the night of, mishandled my, my burn actually. Um, and what they ended up doing is they ended up insulating it. So what happens with grease when it had gotten to the depth that my burn had gotten, it, it actually continued to like cook my skin for lack of a better word overnight. And so I had gotten really bad infections. It was a whole really bad situation. Um, so after I got out of the hospital, you know, the doctors had set forth like a really excruciating road to recovery that I was gonna have to deal with over the next year. Being that I was in an art program, um, much like I believe you guys do like quarter schedules, right? Like 12 weeks, is that a thing that you guys do? So it's like very intense, I would assume, like you guys are doing a lot in like a short period of time. And so I just couldn't keep up. Um, I couldn't keep up with the workload and blessing in disguise, I ended up having to drop, you know, from that program. Um, I did make a full recovery, thank Guitar Hero. Uh, that was like the best hand rehab ever. <laughs> um, but, you know, at this point, I'm 20 years old. I have big dreams and no budget. I'm waiting tables in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm making $2.15 an hour because Texas's laws are nuts. $2.15 an hour plus tips. And I'm like, I've got to get out of Texas. First of all, like it's 2007, eight, nine, Texas, Texas has made some progress, but like it was 2007, eight, nine, and I needed to get the hell out of there. Um, I told my family again, like, Hey, you know, I wanted to do hair. We tried this other thing. I have this rare opportunity. I felt like to use my hands again. Like there was a real conversation. We were sitting there where I didn't have feeling. I didn't have sensation. Um, and we didn't know if I was going to be able to use my hands again. And so there was this real, like, ugh, like, what am I doing? You know, it was this first realization that I had that like, maybe I was prioritizing the way that my family wanted me to live out my life. And while I understand, like, they just wanted um, what was best, um, I knew deep down that I, like, I had, I believe, like, life is written in the stars, right? So, like, I knew that I was destined to do something, and I was just like, I have to go do it, and it's in hair. I'll figure it out, but I have to do hair. And so, it's pretty amazing the way that, like, potentially losing your life or losing a limb can really shift perspective. And I told my family, I didn't want to take it for granted. And like this time my family was like, yeah, do it, go for it. Like we support you a hundred percent. And being where I was at in my life, I knew that like, I was going to have to do something pretty drastic in order to get there. So um, I don't really come from money. Uh, my parents had helped me the best they could with my art school. And at that point it was kind of just like, we didn't have the ability and I had no way of like getting funding. And I really didn't want to like, I didn't know it at the time, but like student loans and all that, I just didn't want to do that. I mishandled like a credit card when I was 18 and I was like, whoa, loans, yikes. Um, so I actually like followed my dad's path and I enlisted in the military. If you're somebody who's ever done that, um, I'm sorry, uh, congrats. You should be proud and mostly like, I'm glad you're still here. If you know people that have been in the military, give them an extra hug because it's a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird, ooh, it's weird. 10 out of 10 don't recommend, but also there's like a weird dynamic to it because had I not done that, like I truthfully really couldn't be here like doing what I'm doing now. Um, my heart and soul, like when we think about politics and stuff, I know, especially in those areas, we, we think about military. Um, there's a lot of feelings around that. So like, 
for whatever. I'm not somebody that condones that stuff. Like I just had to do what I had to do to get where I needed to go. Um, once I separated from the military, it was 2013. I moved actually out of Bremerton, Washington, down to LA. And that's when I kind of started my ultimate hair dream. I wanted to get to Los Angeles and that's what I did. I went downtown and my early career was like everything you could ever hope and dream it would be. Um, I found myself around some of the wildest experiences. I was afforded incredible opportunities. I was styling VPs, CEOs, presidents of huge corporations that were sponsoring big red carpet events like the Emmys and the ESPYs and the Grammys and the AMAs. And to be around all of that and around such money um, was something that, like I said, I was always told I'll never have access to. I'm queer, I'm brown, I'm a woman, all of these things. And I chose to get tattoos, you know, like I did this as soon as I was 18. I told my mom when I was 13, I'm gonna be covered in tattoos. Like I knew what I wanted to do and I knew what I wanted to look like. And it's that a little bit old school mentality, right? Where back in their day, you didn't have tattoos. You, you were looked at as a gangster. You were looked at as a criminal. Like there's all these false perceptions that come with this stuff. And to be honest, that's also something that was so alluring about it to me because I felt like I was like sneaking in to this elite club that I was not supposed to be at. And like, I would put on a blazer because we had all these crazy rules and like I had a neck tattoo. So like, I would have to cover everything. And somehow I was like, ma I masked my way in to be around all of these like stupid rich people. And I chose to pick their minds and ask them all these kinds of questions about their businesses and how to set things up. And what did you do with this? And did you go to school and like LLC or corpse or like, I just asked questions and I didn't even know what words meant sometimes, you know, they'd say stuff and I'm like writing it down so I could go home and Google it. But for me, my clients were the knowledge. They were my well that I had access to dip into. I even had several of them. I built reputations um, over the years where I actually had them. I had one man in particular, I'll never forget. He was from Dubai and he offered to build me a salon in Dubai. And at that time, I don't know, I don't even know. <laughs> I was just like, no way. Um, for me, it was like a control thing. Like I didn't want some man, it was a fantastic opportunity, right? Like that sounds incredible, but I didn't want some man to have some sort of say or control. I, in fact, I didn't want anybody. And still to this day, I feel this way. I don't want anybody to have control over where my business goes. And I feel this way in terms of like where I want my business to go to, because when I talk about having to like seek out investors or potentially start looking at these new partnerships, there's a huge trust disconnect that happens for me. And that's because of all of the things that I sort of have going against me in the business world in general. Uh, I am uneducated in the proper business way. I'm, I'm brown and queer, I'm all of these things. Um, but I think ultimately to be able to trust somebody to take my business where I want it to go and to not corrupt it. I don't trust anybody to do but myself, right? So. I knew that I had to do it my own way and that was exactly what I wanted to do. So I turned down these opportunities and I was like, no, I'm gonna do it how I want, which is very un Virgo of me, right? So I did make a lot of money those years and as many 20 something year olds do, um, I lost it all too. So 2017, I hit my first rock bottom. I lost a marriage, I lost my job. I lost my money, I lost myself. I decided in all of this that I hated hair and I didn't even wanna to touch hair ever again. Uh, over the next year, I would spiral into alcohol abuse. 
I would try to stop existing on more than one occasion before I admitted to anybody that I needed help. And it's actually really crazy for me to think back to somehow amidst all that chaos, like deep down my subconscious knew that I was intended for something. And I was still somehow able to like go back to barbering college because I had only gotten a cosmetology license at that time. I went back to barbering college and then I went back for a medical esthetician program um, because I've I've since I was six years old, um, I would start cutting my doll's hair. Like I've been obsessed with hair forever. My mom could tell you stories about all of the things in the house I cut for no reason. There was no reason I needed to cut my socks or the couch cushions or the carpet. There was none, but I just loved having scissors in my hands. And getting back to all of it, it was my goal deep down to get as much knowledge that I could about my industry. Because if there was anything that I had known or observed up to this point, it was that people with knowledge get the most respect, right? And so if I could have the most knowledge in hair, in skin, in all of these things, then I would be looked at as acceptable. Then I would be someone that people could look at and say, okay, they know what they're talking about. Um, so knowledge was power and that was what I did. Somehow I was able to make it through those programs and the end December, 2018, I decided to go California sober, which is plant medicine only, uh, sans the alcohol. Um, and for that first time, when I started to heal myself and really get back to who I was and see what I wanted to do with my life and where I wanted to go, I finally started to fall back in love with hair. And I started to reconsider having a business again. Like if, if you could talk to anybody who knew me during those years, I would think I was a completely different person. Like, I don't think you would recognize me today. So I don't say any of this to you guys for you to like feel bad or any of that. What I want to do is I just want to normalize like how weird life is period. And like, it is hard to adult. It is hard to adult when you've had trauma, like regardless of where your trauma comes from and why. But when you add on adulting and like neurospice and like everything that we have to deal with on day to day basis is like life is a shit show sometimes and you just can't be ashamed, you know, like we have to normalize the fact that if you're going to really be an entrepreneur, right, like take the risk and hope you gain profit. Like you also have to be really willing to fail. And if I took a piece of advice from anybody, they said, learn how to fail and fail fast. Because the faster you fail, the faster you can figure out what doesn't work. And the moment you figure out what doesn't work, you start figuring out what does, right? So we got to normalize the fact that you are going to succeed really high and you are going to tank fail. You are going to want to quit. You are going to want to start over. You are going to cry. You are going to doubt everything that you have ever done in your whole entire life. If you spoke to me, you could go through my text messages right now as I was prepping for this speech. And like my friends will tell you, I was like, are you sure? Is this fine? Am I okay? It's normal. It is normal to doubt yourself. And it is normal to wonder if what you're doing is right. Because especially when you're somebody who wants to do it in the right way, like ethically, to build sustainable businesses, to like my goals are to be able to, to get so big that like I can hire my clients who are accountants, who are financial advisors, who are architects. Like I want to build so that I can give jobs to the types of people that I want to work with, right? It's not so that I can become a millionaire. Like if that happens, fantastic, great. But also it's not, it's not, it's not my goal. It's not where my heart is at. It's not my intention. It's not my driving force. So if you're privileged enough to have not had to face the demons that I faced, like I appreciate you for not judging me. 
if you are privileged enough to have experienced those pains, I'm proud of you for making it. And I will tell you that had I not experienced those moments, I really wouldn't be the business owner that I am. Because, because of all those things, I view people and I view the world with such humanness and such empathy because I've been there. Like I've been at that bottom. I know what it is like. So embrace those moments of your humanity and use those things to guide your morals and ethics, especially if you're looking at in, in, in going into entrepreneurship where your morals and your ethics are gonna have to be your guide. Like you have to know your why and you have to get really honest with like what you actually want. Like we all want money. Like we can't, we can't deny that, right? Like we need money to pay our bills, but there's people, you, we see them all over social media. We interact with them every day, right? Where they're just like, I just want to be rich. I want to be money. I want these cards and I want this stuff. Like, it's easy to get lost in that and to get trapped in that. And when you give in to that, it's so easy to then sell out, right? Like we we grew up in the punk emo era, right? And oh, what was like the biggest thing that we hated more than anything was when people sold out. Like I'm still low key mad at like Haley Williams because I loved Paramore when Paramore didn't do this poppy shit. Like ain't it? good is so damn catchy. I'm mad about it, but like, I want to get back to that misery business. And it's a shame, you know, when we feel like, dang, these people sold out. And in a lot of ways, like I think about that stuff when I'm sitting with myself and I'm talking about like where I want to go and how I want to do things. And I believe truly like wholeheartedly that had I not failed in the ways that I did, I would just simply continue mishandling the success, right? So I am currently having a great amount of success, which I'm so grateful for, but I don't think that I would have handled it the same way now, like had I not effed it up back then. And because of that, I'm actually really able to like discern, you know, I have these m moments where like money starts to really talk and I'm able to put myself back in that place where you had all that money before and you prioritize chasing the dollar. And it just led me to burnout. It led me to hating this thing that I love the most that I've wanted to do my whole entire life. Like you can chase the money, go for it if, if you want to, but you should know that it's going to come with a consequence and it kind of eats away at your soul. So by finding that, I'm actually going to finally get to the point where I came to talk to you about anything in the first place, which was like, how do I not sell my soul to the corporate devil for a profit, right? So if you are a member of the Alphabet Mafia or if you're an ally, you are very much aware of the term rainbow capitalism. I think this year was especially, um, it was especially obvious, right? We had so many instances where trans Influences, influencers were elevated on these corporate platforms, cough, cough, Target, cough, cough, Bud Light. Um, <clears throat> don't go there, Jen, don't go there. <laughs> uh, but what it exposed is that these corporations are taking advantage of the fact that there are queer people out there and they're trying to make a buck, right? So this year alone also shifted the way that like it shed a light on people differently, which allowed me to start thinking about people and how we as people are using our money, spending our money and thinking about money. So something that I think about a lot, right, is the submarine catastrophe. It unfolded those five wealthy people for the first time in history, like this crazy stuff is going on and people are being savage, right? Like we are empathetic beings and these people lost their lives and people were like, well, too bad. No, sorry for you. Like what that showed me is not that like we are getting colder as a society. What it showed me in fact is that as, as employees, as workforce people, we are paying attention to what the big owner high ups of our corporations are doing. We want to know, what are you doing? I'm working hard for you. What are you doing for me? And if it doesn't vibe, like 
I love the younger generations because y'all don't give a fudge, man. Y'all are just like, this doesn't make sense. I'm done. And when I grew up, it's like, well, this really doesn't make sense, but I guess I'm going to try and make it make sense because a man said I'm supposed to. And y'all are just like, nah, that's stupid. Like, it's amazing. So what we saw is this frustration from people who are like, you guys so carelessly invested ridiculous amounts of money to go down into a place that we've already like made movies and seen documentaries. And it's like, just watch the video like the rest of us did. So how many of these employees left birthday parties, missed funerals, like births of their kids, right? Like so many people are breaking their backs for the CEOs to make a spare quarter of a million to spend on a ticket to go see the Titanic, right? And that didn't sit well with people who are the labor, people who are doing the things. And what that tells me is that people want to feel valued. If they're going to work for you and do labor, they want to feel that their energy is appreciated, that they are not just being another dollar in your pocket. And it's a shift in moral obligation. Like the younger generations, they want to put their money where their morals are a lot of times. And to me, it's a huge shift. So like how, how do we do it? How to create sustainable businesses and how do we create companies that people want to stay working for? How do we get to the top without standing on the heads of other people? Is it even possible? Like, I'm, I'm not going to lie, you guys. This whole thing is a conversation. It is a invitation for us to get curious with one another. Because to be honest with you, I don't know. Like, I am currently in the exact space in my business where I'm trying to figure out, can I scale? Can I grow? Can I do it in an ethical way? Can I do it without taking advantage of people? Like, I believe in my heart and soul and mind like that, that the answer is yes. But I also believe that there's already a path paved down the corporate, corrupt corporate ladder structure. And there's a blueprint for that that's really easily accessible, right? So I know if I wanted to do it really fast, I could. Um, but although it can be really enticing, I personally, I don't have it in my heart to be able to sleep at night if I knew that I was taking advantage of people, it's just, I would be too ashamed of myself. And like, if I couldn't, like, would my dog be proud of me? You know what I mean? Like, if I told him what was up, would he be stoked at what I was doing? So I believe we are as a society, like shifting all together and how money is even being perceived. I believe this because media social media has drastically changed the way that people can make money, right? Like it has given people stupid amounts of money. It is unprecedented where we are going in media and how that is making money. Like we all know about that little eight-year-old kid who started out testing toy videos. And by the time he's 10 years old, he is worth more than I will ever make in my life because he's playing with a pogo stick and an RC card. Like good for you. Disappointed I didn't get that creative, but amazing he's rich and not even hit puberty like incredible you guys this is not what things were like when I was younger it was not like this there was a true distinction between the high class the middle class and the low class if you looked like you had money you probably did because if you didn't you didn't dare spend your rent money on a Gucci suit there was just no way you did that occasionally I have other barbershops and salon owners who will reach out to me for advice on like how to price and how to get their business models going. And an area that we almost always get stuck at is like prices. And I've told you guys this a lot, but I can't lie. And I get stuck on my own price too in value. So when you are the business, when you're the brand, when you're the owner, when you're the entrepreneur, and when you're also your most ideal client, it can get a little bit weird to decide how do you place your value on which hat, you know, that you're wearing. So what if I price too high? What if I price too low? What if people stop coming to me? Like, thank you, socialization as a female, because the ruminating thoughts of doom, shame and guilt, like the character building is immaculate. Um, 
I'm a creature of trial and error though. So I stand here with full confidence in saying like, trust your value from the jump. You know you the best and you know what you have to offer more than anybody else. But also like do it honestly, price yourself honestly and stay humble in that and give yourself room to grow. Like I was really uncomfortable to start at a high price. So I started a little bit lower and it gave me that flexibility to raise up. So I'm somebody that believes very much in like the tortoise and the hare, right? Slow and steady wins the race. What started out for me as a desire to not run because these knees, I actually picked up a lot of patterns as I was walking on my journey. And using the example from earlier, if somebody wanted to buy a Gucci suit, if somebody has decided that that Gucci suit is valuable, if it makes them feel good, if it makes them look, show up, present in the world in a way that is going to give them something, they are going to reallocate their money and shift it around and spend it on what they want to spend it on. Like we aren't doing the same stuff like we did back in the day where it's like a hundred dollars for groceries and a thousand dollars for rent. Like people will move stuff around to get what they want. We are in an influencer based market where we are being sold stuff all of the time. And we get that drive to be it, to be those people, to be cool. And so, okay, I will not order DoorDash for a week and I'm going to go buy this thing that this influencer told me. So the way that people are choosing to spend their money is completely different. I started out charging uh, $45. I'm getting ready to jump up to 75. Last year, I jumped up to 55. I'm doing a pretty big unprecedented jump typically in my business. If you're booked 80% of the time, eight to nine weeks consistently, then that is the market telling you you're too cheap. Well, I've been booked out a year solid, basically. I raised my price 10 bucks and I thought it would clear some people out. If anything, it actually got me busier. Um, so there is a weird dynamic that happens when you like let yourself be free of like, I have to make this money, I have to make this money. I know that is scary to say, but sometimes you really have to just trust yourself and trust your idea and trust your business because people will spend their money in places they find it valuable. They will. They will reallocate where they spend money. Maybe they won't buy uh, whatever. They're going to do something else to make sure that they can support you. So I'm super terrified to keep raising my price. I really am I'm kind of trying to get at a $100 uh, price point here pretty soon. But the way that I have found it to be the most sustainable is I was able to figure out a tier system. So I brought in barbers that have different experience levels that I can price at a slightly lower business model, right? So as I jump up, people who don't want to or can't or whatever pay that price, rather than forcing them to go to great clips, I'm just gonna provide them with an artist that, that is at that skill level and at that price point to meet them there. So rather than ever losing anybody, I've actually created like a recirculating loop of my clients because I don't want to lose them. I don't want them to go anywhere else. And I'm also providing a service that they're not getting at Great Clips. I'm a queer barbershop. LGBTQ people, queer people are my priority to create a safe space to make sure that we have somewhere we belong and feel at home. That is the priority, period. And the money is always going to sort itself out, right? Woo. So how do I choose to stay accessible in those ways? I just had to get really, really creative. I had to get creative with my business. I had to get creative with my business model to figure out who is my market, what do they need? And I figured out how to do it. I had to humble myself and say, okay, maybe I'm not seeing a hundred clients a month. Maybe I'm only seeing 80, but you know what? That, that other 20, they're still staying in my business. They're just supporting a barber who is working with me. So it doesn't need to be me. I'm releasing that greed. It doesn't need to go into my pocket. What I understand is that by giving to my new barbers, feeding into them while also continuing to build and establish the trust with my clients, they are going to ride and rock with me so hard. And that has been something that I have proven currently. All of my clients who are with me, who have stayed with me at my price jumps. I've been really transparent about what my intention is and what my goals are. And they've been honest with me back in return and said, hey, Jen, this is what I can and can't do. And this is what I'm looking for. Okay, 
Let me create that for you. So a lot of times when it comes to entrepreneurship, or I guess the best way that I have found for myself is we can't look at it in the way that like we were socialized to think about it. We can't think about it in the way that we, these really big corporate people are doing. We have to get completely creative and like create our own business models because these models don't exist currently. Like right now with rainbow capitalism, right? We are all trying to boycott these companies. We're trying to put our money where our morals are, but there's not enough companies with good morals to invest into. So like, we almost have no choice, but to like go back and go back to the corporate ladder. So all of this to say that we need more business owners to really be down with fighting to figure it out ethically and sustainably, right? Like we don't know how to do it because it's not typically done. So we are the ones, we are the trailblazers who are figuring it out. We are the ones saying, okay, I'm going to try this way. Well, that didn't work. Okay. I'm going to try this way. Well, that didn't work. Okay. I'm going to try this way. Now I'm hard headed as hell. And like, thankfully I figured out that like, okay, the tier system is what's going to work best for me. So I would encourage you and whatever it is with your business to get creative, try to think outside of that box. That's what you're doing as an entrepreneur, period. Like you already have an idea. The universe gave you that. If you were born and you decided, oh, I think I want to be an entrepreneur. Like, I don't believe that we have just, I don't believe in happenstance. Like I'm a real believer in like intentionality. So if you were given an idea to have a business or to have a brand or to like, create a thing like you were likely given that gift from whatever higher power that it is you believe in and you can keep fighting it all you want but it's going to continue nagging at your stomach so just dive in get prepared to get messy and go for it try it because i can't sustain and keep building and encourage other people to do it in ethical ways if i don't have the backup support of other entrepreneurs and other businesses for us to lean in on each other. Like I work with other barbers who do queer stuff too. And we're like, Hey, I'm having this feeling. It's like, Oh yeah, dude, me too. Like we need each other. We need each other to be like, Hey, I'm doing this. Oh, I tried this. Maybe try this. Oh, I tried this. Maybe try this. Like it doesn't need to be this dog eat dog thing. Like if, if we know anything is there's, um, there's so much money, right? There is so much money for everybody to have. And if we just help each other, then we will get so much further than trying to do it on our own. So in finishing, will you be on the side of history that's for good? Or will you be on the side of history that's for bad? Will you do things in an ethical way? Will you get creative? Will you join me in changing the way you look at money, perceive money, need money, and view money? Like, yes, money, we need it. But I promise you, it is so weird why it works that way. I don't know. But the moment you surrender, truly, it all just comes back and you kind of just let the universe like do its thing. They talk about that alignment thing. It's weird. I don't know why it works. My mom would call it God. But it works. I'm proof of it. There's no reason I should be here. I am not a business person. I do not have the education that you have. I do not have the resources that you have. I barely finished high school. I joined the military. I have a plethora of things and reasons why I shouldn't be here and succeeding, but I am. So if I can do it, I know without a doubt you guys can too. That's it. <laughs>